What is your favourite Sean Bean movie then? Well, I'd have to give that some serious thoughts. I, I know what you mean, yeah. Essex Boys, National Treasure, When Saturday Comes. When Saturday Comes certainly takes some beating. It is a bit of a belter. Mine's probably Wild in the Streets, though. Really? Yeah, you know, the documentary that he narrated about the annual Shrove Tide football match that takes place in Ashbourne, Derbyshire. Oh, right. Not aware of that one. You are now. That's where you get the idea of a derby from. You know, like two teams from the same town competing in Derbyshire. Oh, right. Yeah. Interesting. Isn't it? You know, Sean Bean's had more on screen deaths than Ernest Borgnine. Really? Yeah. I used to have a piece of paper with Ernest Borgnine's name next to my bedroom. And Rock Star. I can remember the two of them simultaneously, you see. But I'm over that now. It's amazing what you can achieve. I just have the problem with Charlton Heston and Kurt Douglas now. The origins of the game are unknown. People have suggested it's a human head tossed from one side to the other. But we'll never know now because all the records were lost in a fire in the record office in the 1890s. In the same way as all my medical records were lost in Worcester Street Surgery in Stourbridge in the 1970s. You always have been a bit medically inexplicable. What are you trying to say? In 1683, Charles Cotton described the two sides in the Shrove Tide football match, the Uppards and the Downards, as ranged apart like roll-right stones, predating the Comingsian connection between the two places by more than 300 years. The spire of St Oswald's emerging like a dream from the bunting that Ashbourne seems to have wisely kept in place. Being in Ashbourne it feels like walking into a colour plate in a Batsford book of English villages, published 1952. You know what I mean? Fancy a spot of building word association again, Harris? Uh, yeah, okay. About that one over there. Um, it reminds me of uh, certain certain very old colonial buildings in Arequipa, Peru. Mm, practice of nailing new boys to the wall for me, I'm afraid. The spire of St Oswald's Church. St Oswald prayed for the souls of his men when he knew that all was lost and for his pains, his head and limbs were stuck on spikes. George Eliot called it the finest single spire in all England. G.F. Bodley copied it in Cambridge, but he couldn't compete with that wide and glorious sense in a Derbyshire churchyard. St Peter's in Rome might have the largest unsupported dome. It might be the largest church this side of the Alps. The man who works on St Peter's might have the nicest pair of trousers ever worn by anyone who worked anywhere. But for pure, crazy, twisty, circuitous non sequiturousness, Ashbourne St Oswald's beats it hands down.
Look at this for a stunning museum of Derbyshire alabaster monuments. freely amid these works of art, exhilaratingly of their time and utterly timeless. John Smith's magnet obscuring the iconic green man and black's head gallows sign like 18th century whitewash over a medieval wall painting. Easier to remove though. Life, a game of two halves by Michael Portillo. We haven't missed it. We're all a great jumble of things. Songs and snippets, lyrics and images. Some of them lodge very early and very deeply and stay with us for a very long time. In 1978, the lyric, I like to glide along the green light of a July afternoon, sliding down a vague conversation. From ultravoxes I can't stay long, lodged with me, and still there. And here it is, the green light of a July afternoon, like the green light on the end of Daisy's Pier, tumbling down into the town. Ashbourne's good at that. what I call a sloping English marketplace. If you like sloping English marketplaces in the same way as Clash fans like The Clash, then that's White Man in Hammersmith Palais and Penrith's complete control. Okay then, Harris, what about that one? Reminds me of a building uh, in the town from the final standoff in the Wild Bunch. Okay. Reminds me of the work dance at the end of Trumpton. And a bit uh, Charlton Heston at the end of Planet of the Apes. Or was it Kurt Douglas? No, it was um, Ernest Borgnine. Was it Rod Steiger? I don't know what Turog bread is, but that lettering makes it sound ace. I wonder if you put the name of any foodstuff in gold lettering on the side of a building and it makes it appealing. Goblin meat pies. No, it doesn't. You know, I've always had a mind to walk Dovedale. 
I'm going to do it. See her at the other end then. Lover's Leap is named after a local story in which a local woman, thinking her husband was dead in the Napoleonic Wars, leapt off the precipice, her dress snagged and she was saved. On arriving home, she found out that he wasn't dead after all. We were going to reenact this scene, but Harris forgot his dress again. Actually, I'm not sure I've got all that. You what? I think I ran out of battery about half hour ago. I think we might need to go and do it again. You're joking. Nah. All right then. As long as you go and get your dress. All right. I think I've had enough of walking in water now. You'll never be the Messiah with an attitude like that. So, our below stone circle, what does it remind you of? Of the whole thing or individual stones? Individual stones. Um, Royal Devonshire Hospital, Buxton, Chublock Building, Wolverhampton, Great Rollwright Church and Ashby de la Zouge Castle. Alright. What about you? Um, well that one over there, the back looks like a beached whale. Yeah. And the one next to it looks like a, a broken Oreo. And that broken craggy one there. This one here? It looks like Bill Wyman. You're wrong. Looks like Charlie Watts. I'm tired now from pulling apart and reassembling all those narrative threads. So, I've got to go catch a movie. Maybe Matthew McConaughey. I'll see you around.